Good morning. Good to see everybody this morning. Um, back in the 1700s, God was doing this incredible thing in the Anglican Church in, in England. Um, he was bringing about kind of a revival there. There was this movement happening, and one of the leaders of that move, movement was this guy named John Wesley. Some of you might have heard of him before. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Methodist Church. The Methodist Church came out of the Anglican Church. And he was a young man um, in the 1700s, in the early 1700s, when he left the familiarity of England and his life there, and he was called to come to America, uh, to Georgia, and to evangelize these Native Americans who were there. In fact, at least that's what he thought that he would be doing. Uh, but in order to get to the New World, uh, John had to take a trip across the Atlantic Ocean on a vessel with a group of Moravian believers. Now, these Moravian believers, they're from Germany. They're originally from uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, but this was this group of Christians who were very, very different from John Wesley. John Wesley was this well-educated guy. He went to Oxford. Now, get this. He started this group at Oxford called the Holy Club. He was a, co he was a real crazy college guy. He started the, the Holy Club. Uh, just imagine if you started a club like that. Uh, later, his, the people that followed him that were kind of a part of his group uh, in the Anglican Church, they became known as Methodists, which was a derogatory term because of how methodical they were with, with the way that they lived out their faith. But it was actually also at the same time a compliment as well, right? Because it was like they had this method to how they wanted to share the gospel with people, how they wanted to live out this faith of theirs. And so John Wesley was this really good man, this really great Christian man, this really great Anglican man in the 1700s whose faith was really firm and solid, or at least he thought that his faith was really firm and solid until he got onto that boat to go and cross the ocean and come to America. Now, keep in mind, uh, this is 1735. This is not some naval ship that he's on like we have today, some modern ship. This is a wooden ship, and he gets on this boat, and he gets out into the middle of the ocean. And now just imagine this. They get into this huge storm, and just imagine being at the bottom. This is kind of the way that I imagine it, being at the bottom of one of those waves and just looking up and seeing these huge towering waves uh, above you. Has anybody ever been in that kind of a situation? I don't, a few people have. Okay, wow. Uh, it, it'd be hard for me to imagine that. But, but now, now, more than that, just imagine you're looking up, you're looking at those waves, but then you look up and you see the mast just snap in, in half. That's what happened to John Wesley on this boat that he was on. And, and it's an incredible thing to be faced with. I'd love for you to just think on your own how you would react in that kind of a moment, what you would be feeling, because I think that that's about all it would take to show me who I really am. That's about all it took for John to look inside and see what his faith was really made of, because it wasn't made of what he thought it was made of. It was very different. He had a very different faith that became crystal clear in that moment. And it was not the kind of man that he had lived, that he had practiced, that he thought that he was. Because John was what most of us would be in that moment. John was scared. He was absolutely terrified for his life. But there was a group of people on that boat that was not scared at all. They were called the Moravians. I mentioned them. The, these Moravian believers, these people... Uh, while John was terrified for his life, they were singing this song saying, we are neither afraid for ourselves or our children, is the way that it went. That, just imagine that. The masks like snapping, uh, uh, we're not afraid for ourselves or our children. It's like, where did that come from? You know, that, and I think that's what John was thinking. He's looking at these people going, where did that come from? Um, John is terrified for his life, and they're singing this stuff. While John was hopeless, these people had hope right next to him. And while all that he could think about was the storm, all that these Moravian believers could think about was what God had done in them, what God was doing in them, and what God was going to continue to do in their lives. And there's nothing quite like a storm to expose the conditions of what's really going on inside of us, right? 
There's nothing quite like a storm. Because for John, as a young man, it exposed that even though he preached about a God of peace, and even though he, he preached about living a life of faith, all it took was one storm to show that that was actually probably not as deep as he thought. He probably didn't believe that as much as he thought he believed that. He, he believed in that moment in the vacancy of his emotions, the fact that he did not feel God there in the minute. In that moment, he believed that. Out on the high seas, John, the scholar, the scholarly guy who loved God, the theologian, became an atheist on the seas. Like, where's God? An atheist on the seas in a moment is what happened. This brilliant preacher realized as he's looking at this group of people who actually were living out the faith that he had preached about for all these years. And that revelation started to lead John in a little bit of a different direction in his life. It started to lead to some other things. But I have a feeling that it's not just John Wesley who would act this way in the midst of a storm like that. I have a feeling that there's something in each of our lives that acts like something of a kind of spiritual kryptonite almost. It's something that can grow into a storm in our lives, and it could be just about anything. Uh, it could be about anything. I would say it's anything that convinces you that you are alone. Anything in your life that when, when you come to it again and again, it convinces you that God's not real, God's not there, you're all alone, don't believe any of it. What, what's the thing that when you experience it causes you to disbelieve in God in that moment and expose the vacancy inside of your own self? I mean, for some of us, it, it honestly could be money. We need money for so many things, for building project here at the church. It's like everything we do in our life, we could all use more money. Who doesn't need more money? But some, sometimes, for some of us, money just takes, takes the reins of our lives. Uh, money is the sort of thing that for some of us, it's, we've become so focused on it, on it, we've actually lost relationships for some of us because of money. Uh, for some of us, it's cost us family. It's cost us a great deal. It has, ironically, we think we're going to have more with it, and sometimes it isolates us. It, it causes us relational storms in our life because it just gets out of hand. It could be our relationships themselves. Maybe it's not money, but maybe it's relationships. Some of us might be codependent, and that's the sort of thing where, ironically, you just want more and more relationships, and if you let that keep going on its own, you ironically find yourself more isolated from people, more on your own. It turns into this small thing that turns into a big storm in our lives, and all of a sudden, we start believing, like, there's something wrong with me. I'm isolated. I'm on my own. And so for some of us, our deep need for relationship can actually become this chaotic storm in our life that isolates us from God. It isolates us from other people. Storms can look like a lot of things in our lives. Those are just two small examples, but they can look like a lot of things in our lives, but they always lead to, a sa to the same place, to a place of isolation and chaos in our lives. And a storm in our life makes us believe that we are alone in the world. It makes us forget about all of our prior experiences of peace with God, of joy, of fellowship that we've had with God. We just, it makes us forget about all of that stuff when something that's small and manageable in our life becomes this bigger thing and turns into this big chaotic storm. And we forget about who God is. Is. And that's exactly, that's exactly what the disciples are facing at this moment in the book of John. So I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles, if you have a Bible, to John chapter 6. Uh, we do need to just do a little bit of a refresher of where we're coming from. It's been a couple weeks where we've taken this break in this um, series in the book of John, and now we're jumping back in in John chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 14. I know it said we were going to start at verse 16. But I don't play by those rules, so we're going to do verse 14 is how we're going to start. But before we do that, I'm going to give just a little bit of a backstory. Uh, the last time Brian preached, he preached on the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, Jesus fed 5,000 people miraculously. We actually think, you know, those are 5,000 men. So we think that's probably more like 10,000, I would guess, people. You start talking about women and children who are there. 
Jesus is feeding this huge, huge crowd of people. And Jesus has been revealing himself through the Gospel of John. If you look all the way through the Gospel of John, that's what Jesus is doing. He's revealing himself in all of these different ways. So you think about chapter 1, Andrew comes to his brother Simon. It's chapter 1, like not that much has happened yet. And Andrew already comes to Simon and said, we found the Messiah. We found him. Like, he's already been revealed enough to Andrew where Andrew's like, this is the guy. Right? In, in chapter 2, Jesus uh, turns water into wine at a wedding feast. And it, it says that this is the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. Now, through the book of John, there are seven signs that Jesus is going to do, and you can start keeping track of them as you go through, that are there to reveal his glory. They're there to reveal his nature to people who are all around him. And that was one of them. In chapter 3, Jesus has this conversation at nighttime with this guy Nicodemus. And again, this isn't one of these seven signs, but it's a conversation that reveals who Jesus is to Nicodemus, to this religious leader. And then in chapter 4, there's this Samaritan woman that Jesus tells her everything about her life. And she goes back to her people and she says, could this be the Messiah? And so people are starting to connect the dots on Jesus in all these different ways. I mean, they're taking the signs, they're taking his teaching, they're taking everything about him. They're starting to connect the dots. They're like, is, is that the Messiah? Is that the king? And Messiah just means king, right? The anointed one of Israel. They're starting to connect the dots on all of these things. And, and they're looking, they're really saying, like, if it's not this guy, who is it going to be? Like, who's, who's going to be the better mess, Messiah that's going to come next and, and outdo what this guy is doing? And so people are starting to make those, to draw those conclusions about Jesus. And it's not just random people, it's his disciples as well. They know that they are following the Messiah, which they all assumed meant that they are following the new king of Israel. He'd be a person from the line of David, but greater than David. He'd be like Moses, but greater than Moses. If you think about that, Jesus fed them in the desert. It's very sim similar to God feeding the Israelites in the desert in the Old Testament. So he's like a new Moses. They're going to go through the water. He's going to calm the sea today in our text. And it's just very similar to how God brought the Israelites through the sea and brought them out of captivity and into freedom. And so there's a message being portrayed here in the book of John that this is a guy like Moses, but it's even more than Moses. And this is who they think they're following, this Messiah, the best of the best, someone who will finally kick out the Romans, start the reign of God, a new political power whose line will never end, and it'll just keep going and going and going. And that's the plan, right? Let's read about the plan. Here we go, verses 14 and 15 in chapter 6. It says, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, which was the feeding of the 5,000, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, he put on a purple robe, he put on gold rings, he took his seat on David's throne in the temple in Jerusalem. That's what it says, right? No. Okay, for those of you online, that's not what it says in the book of John. Let me, let me read it again. This is John chapter 6 again. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. It's a very strange thing to do. Isn't that weird? They had all these expectations of who they were following. They're following the new king. And now here we go. People want to make him the king. This is like the goal of why he came. And he didn't put on a purple robe and gold rings and go and sit in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. He dismissed the crowd and he dismissed his followers and he went to a mountain to be by himself. It's a very, very strange thing for a king to do. But we sometimes forget that Jesus was the only one aware of exactly what he was up to. He was the only one aware of it and, and why he was doing the different things that he was doing. And so in this instance, going off to a mountain to be by himself was strange to everybody except for him. 
It actually reminds me of the, um, when I proposed to my wife, and um, she, this was years ago, and she was going from Milwaukee, and she was going up to a wedding by herself one weekend up in Minnesota, which is where she's from. And so I made her this kind of elaborate thing with several cards, like 20, 25 different envelopes and cards. And so inside every envelope, they were all time marked. You know, it'd be like Thursday at 2 p.m., you open up envelope number one. And she'd open it up, and it might have a little, like, note inside of it. It might have, like, $5, and it'll say, like, go to Colectivo and buy yourself a drink. Hope you have a great afternoon. You know, Thursday, 4 o'clock comes, open up the next card. It's just some sappy song that I wrote. You know, 6 o'clock, here we go. And you open up card after card, and they're all very intentional. It's like, all right, now you're driving up to Minnesota. Make sure you open this up while you're on the drive, and here's some money for lunch. You're going to go to the specific restaurant that we met at in Eau Claire. It's like very, very specific. And little did she know that while she's driving up to go to this wedding, I'm also driving up, but she doesn't know that I'm coming, and I'm going to set up this thing at this park overlooking downtown Minneapolis, and when she gets to the wedding, she's on, you know, envelope number 20 at this point. And she opens it up, and it says, it says, open it up immediately when you're done eating dinner at the wedding. And so she opens it up, and it says, leave the wedding. All, like, you have to leave right now. And then it starts taking her to, like, here's 20 bucks. Go to this wine shop. Ask the person. He's got the bottle of wine ready for you already. And, like, everything's planned out until eventually she finally gets to the park where there I am, and there's candles everywhere, and I've got a guitar, and it's this whole thing, and I ask her, right? Now, yeah, it's not, whatever. <laughs> now, to anybody else not familiar with us, or with her, all of these random crazy things that she's doing, isolated, if you just look at each moment, would not make much sense. Like, why are you doing all of these random things. It doesn't make that much sense. But to me, to the person who has a vision from beginning to end of how I want this to go, every single one of these things makes perfect sense. It's totally intentional, and I've also provided everything she's going to need along the way, every single step along the way for what she's going to do at every single place. And for a person like her who trusts me, She's like, I'm along for the ride, and I'm, and I'm going to go with it, you know? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust that you're leading me in a place that's going to be a good place. And so it starts to make absolute sense. But I sometimes wonder if for Jesus, if the things that Jesus did confused his followers but made all the sense in the world to him. It's like he understood the program in a way that nobody else understood it. Because we get this sense as we read about what Jesus did here. There's this one narrative of the gospel. It could have been very, very different. It could have been rewritten where instead of going to a mountain to pray, Jesus simply lets this huge crowd, think about it, 10,000 people would have walked him down to Jerusalem at this moment to become the king. And he could have let that happen, but he doesn't. Which means that God's plan often looks very little like our plan. It doesn't mean that our plans and God's plans are always totally separate from one another. You know, there is something about wisdom, about having wisdom and about learning God's plan that's real, that we can make plans, and that's a good thing. But the real reality is that very often God has a vision. It says in Scripture, he sees from beginning to end the whole story, and we are just somewhere in the middle with our heads down here with waves way up above us, and we can't see it. And yet God sees it. And so he has a plan that very often it's very different from my plan about what I would do with my life or, or with the world that I live in. And so it simply means, and Jesus knew this, that it simply means that being connected to God is so much more important than being connected to what my friends think or what the news is telling me or what culture at large is saying, is not that all that stuff is bad. It just means that being connected to God is obviously much more important because he's the only one who sees from beginning to end. See, he's the only one who actually knows the plan. And Jesus knows this. 
And he hears that the crowd wants to make him king, and he doesn't entertain it for a moment, and he dismisses the crowd, and he dismisses his disciples, and he goes to be alone so he can hear the one voice that matters. That's it. So he can hear the one voice that matters. And while he's doing this, here's what it says in verses 16 and 17. It says that when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into the boat, And they set off across the lake for Capernaum. And by now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. Now, there's some details here in the book of John. Um, We we missed some of the details, actually, because they're not there in John, but they're there in a couple of the other gospel accounts about this story. One is that Jesus is the one who actually sends his disciples off in the other gospels. It's not like his disciples are just like, going off on their own. Like, where's Jesus? We don't know. We're going to Capernaum. In the other Gospels, Jesus is actually the one who sends them off. Um, And in the other Gospels, this happens immediately. But here in John's Gospel, they wait until evening, and there's a theological reason for that. And it's because in the book of John, many of you are aware, but if you're not, now you will be. There's this theme of light and darkness that's been developing in the book of John, right? And so very often as you read the book of John, there are things that will happen during the daytime, during the light. And light is usually associated with spiritual um, being connected to God. And, And when things happen in the darkness, so think about Nicodemus coming to Jesus at nighttime. It's not just that Nicodemus doesn't want to be seen, It's actually a a sign showing you that Nicodemus is sitting in a kind of spiritual darkness, right? And so you have this theme that's happening. And so here, Jesus sends out his disciples, but it's nighttime. And, And so these occurrences are happening at nighttime without Jesus. They're finding themselves out in the middle of the lake. And so it's interesting that here at this moment, Jesus' disciples go from this moment of great victory of feeding thousands and thousands of people during the day and Jesus being offered to be the king to being without Jesus in the middle of a sea on their own in a storm at night. They're all alone and it happens like back to back. And now considering what we've already established that God's plans often looks very little like my plan for my life, Here's the question. Why is Jesus doing this? Why would he do this? Why why would he send his disciples out to be alone and specifically without him? If I was a disciple, you know where I want Jesus? Right next to me all the time. I never want to let him out of my sight. That's how I would be if I was a disciple. And yet Jesus splits them off and he sends them out onto the sea into the sea that's notorious for storms. In fact, this is a sea that's 600 feet below sea level. And it's got mountains around it, except for on the southern end, there's this plain. And what happens is air fills in from the southern end, and it comes over the water, and there's, you get these huge storms that come up out of nowhere. They know it. Jesus knows it. And so it's a question that not only should we have for them, but we should have it for ourselves too, for our own lives. The question of God why do you send me out into life's storms? Why did you put me in this situation? God, everything was going so well in my life until we were hit with sickness in our family. Or how about this one? I worked all my life to save up a retirement, and then I got to retirement, and now I have been given this horrible disease. In fact, I have a friend, and that was sadly his story. He worked a lifetime, a great Christian man, He worked a lifetime to save up so that he and his wife could spend the last 20, 30 years of their life traveling together. And within a year, he got a disease and passed away. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Or or God, I was doing so well until I lost this close relationship in my life or until the market took a turn and now all of a sudden my bank account looks nothing like it used to. Or fill in the blank in your life. Fill in the blank. It's a stark reminder of one of the most important pieces of wisdom literature in the ancient world. It's the book of Job, which is in our Bible, uh, which is this broader and deeper look at this quick theme here in John's gospel. It's the question of not only why do bad things happen to good people, but specifically, why would God allow or even push us into those things at times? Not that he's the one creating it, but that he's like, yes, 
That's where I want you to go. And we see that happening here with Jesus. Why would he allow these storms and struggles in the lives of people who follow him and love him? Because here in John's gospel, it's exactly what happens. In verse 18, it says that a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Now, John's gospel is really, really short on this account. He really doesn't get into it because the other gospels say things that we don't see here. And there's almost this sense as you read the different gospel accounts that Jesus, when presented with the offer to be king, he uses it as an opportunity to remind his disciples of what their mission is in the first place. In other words, he uses a physical storm to remind his disciples of what his plan actually is. He's saying, you think that the plan is for me to become king, and it's actually a different plan that I have. And so I think in a way, this is Jesus' way of almost throwing some cold water on the whole situation. He's like, oh yeah, we just fed people. It's great. They're going to make me king. You know what? Actually, I'm going to send you out into a storm instead, because think of it. He's already turned water into wine. He's already healed a nobleman's son. He's already healed a lame man by the pool. Jesus has already fed a crowd of five to 10,000 people, and and their opinion of him was unanimous. Let's make this guy our king. But this had nothing to do with what Jesus had come to accomplish, and so he sends them out into a storm, into a wild storm in the pitch black of night to reorient them, to actually snap them back to his reality. He has a plan, and he wants to snap them into his plan. And he's going to use a storm to do it. It it actually reminds me, uh, because this happened to me a couple years ago, the first time that I took my paddleboard out onto Lake Michigan, which some of you are like, don't take a paddleboard on Lake Michigan. Well, yeah, thanks for telling me now. Uh, But I I still enjoy it, actually. But I, I went out on a day, and I go out in Port Washington. There's these high cliffs, and there's wind. If the wind is coming from the west, you don't feel the wind until you get out on the lake because, again, you have a cliff behind you blocking the wind. And so I went out. It was early June. The water was absolutely freezing, and the waves didn't look too bad. And I got out, and I just started heading out into the lake. And I got out pretty far within about five minutes. I was already out within five minutes past uh, the lighthouse and past the breakwaters. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm moving really fast, and the waves are a lot bigger than I thought that they were. And so I I decided, I'm going to just try to turn around and just go back towards the shore. And I found that I was trying my hardest and not moving anywhere. And so I, luckily my paddle converts to like a kayak paddle, so I did that. I sat down and I started kayaking back. It took me about 45 minutes to get back into shore. I fell off of the board once. But it was one of these like stark reminders of the sea and storms can be totally unpredictable. They they can rise up fast. And if you're not familiar with what's happening, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble, especially if you're not wearing a life preserver. I was a really smart person. Um, It was a lesson for me not to go out on days like that, to kind of hug the shoreline and stay close to shore, to take less risks on the water. But for these disciples, there was more at risk than just rough seas. Because for, for Israelites, they always, in the biblical text, they always associate water and seas with chaos. If you look back at Genesis chapter 1, there's actually this, this image of these seas, and that they're known as this primor- primordial sea that is full of chaos. And when you think about the water from these people who really were not people who are on the water very often, it could be a very unforgiving place. People died at sea all the time. There were these creatures that lived in the sea that would come up out of nowhere and they could kill you. They didn't know where they came from. And so the, the water was this place of chaos, but not only that, God is the one who brought order out of the chaos in the biblical text. And so the sea is actually seen as this place where God was not. It was anti-God. It was this chaos place. And so it's this place through which God brings his people in the Exodus story, and Jesus is wanting to show that to his disciples here, that not only is he going to feed his disciples in the desert, but he's going to bring them through the chaos of the storm and the sea as well. Not just the physical sea. Not just the physical sea. The sea in the biblical text is never just the physical place. 
It also has to do with the chaos within which each of us lives. It's a personal chaos. It's a personal sea. It's a personal place where God's presence is not. And Jesus was going to bring them through the chaos of their inner world as well. And it says that as they were on the boat crossing the sea in verses 19 through 21, it says that when they had rowed out about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. In the other gospels, it says they thought he was a ghost, just walking out on the water next to them. But he said, it is I, don't be afraid. And then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately, immediately the boat reached the opposite shore where they were heading. I I think if you were one of the disciples, if I were one of the disciples prior to this moment, and if I was going home to my parents at night, because these were just young guys, what would the headline from the day have read? You guys, Jesus fed 5,000 people, and then they all wanted to make him king. It was the best day ever. And Jesus wanted the headline to read something very, very different. He wanted it to to say something completely different. He wanted to show them that outer success without inner transformation is worthless. He he wanted them to see that you you could have all the outer success in the world, but if you're not a transformed and changed person on the inside, what does it really matter? It's worthless. He's saying, listen, we can feed 5,000 people for a day, but if the cravings of their heart are still the things that's winning out on a day-to-day basis, does it really matter that we fed these people today? Or or if we let them take us to Jerusalem and we have a long reign, let's say we reign for 50 years, but war still exists, and people's inner motivations, their inner life really is kind of unchanged, What was the point of reigning for 50 years? What would the point of any of that be? If we succeed at our human plans, but we miss out on God's plan, can we really call that success? Can we? And so the real sign here isn't the food. The real sign here is is not the offer to be the king. It's actually this. It's having the ability to go through a wild storm in your circumstances, in your life, Dramatic highs in your life followed by lows, desperate lows, and experiencing the power of Jesus' saving presence right there in the moment. I want you to think about that. They were three and a half miles out in the lake, and once they invited Jesus into their situation, it was calm, and they got where they wanted to go. They, they, they transported three and a half miles in an instant because of his presence in the midst of a chaos and a storm. And for the disciples, it must have been this stark reminder as they were miraculously taken to shore. Just imagine yourself there, three and a half miles in a second. The reminder for me would have been something like this. I want this guy's plan to be my plan. Like, he just fed all those crowds and they wanted to make him king and that's very exciting. That's amazing. But he was able to calm the storm and put everything at peace in me in an instant. I want to be with this guy. Wherever he's going, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to be with him. I'm going to trust him. And that's the offer that Jesus has here. And it's the offer for you today as well. Because sometimes we're good on one day, and then the next day, life just throws us something that we weren't expecting at all. And, and the question is, who are you going to go to? Because in this moment, we don't need a good president. We don't need a good governor. We, we don't need like a local politician who's going to stand up for our rights. That's not going to change what you're going through today in the inner places of your heart. What you need is somebody who can go there with you. It's good to have friends to talk to. I have a best friend I can tell anything to, but my best friend can't be with me every moment of the day. There are moments and struggles that you're going to go through that only you can go through. It, it's, it's for you alone. At the end of the day, you have to walk it by yourself unless you invite the one person who is able to be there with you into the situation. And if you do that, he will bring peace in the midst of whatever you're facing. It's not magic. It's not some magic spell. 
It's just God living within you, taking up residence in your life in these moments of chaos. It says that once they saw Jesus walking on the water and they invited him in, it changed everything. And that's the offer for you this morning. Once they realized that they were not alone, but God was with them, the chaos calmed. And it's that same kind of calm that the Moravians had. That's where it came from. That's how they were able to be in the middle of a storm and be totally calm. That's where it came from. And friends, this is why Jesus came. He didn't come to rule some kingdom on earth. He came to conquer the spiritual forces that are alive and well and would love to influence you for your bad so that bad things happen in your life. And Jesus is saying he's already conquered them if you invite him in. He will bring a peace that goes beyond anything that you can understand. Because with Jesus, and this is our big idea this morning, you are never alone. He is the one person who will always be with you. You are never alone because of Jesus. And so the question this morning is just, where do you need Jesus to come into the chaos of your life? It's pretty simple. I wonder what part of your world just feels chaotic this morning. Some of us have become really embittered by storms because for some of us, they're just so unrelenting, we can't see how a good God would allow a storm like that in our lives. And yet here we see a very different image of Jesus and God. We don't see a, an image of Jesus and God who's trying to help us avoid storms. We see an image of a Messiah who came and got into the storm with us and showed us what it looks like to rely on God and to live in his peace in the middle of a storm. We have a Messiah who conquered every storm. And that's the invitation for you this morning you'll start to trust him like a best friend if you learn to trust him in the middle of a storm. And so I just want to share one thing before we end this morning. Um, John Wesley's brother, Charles Wesley, was one of the most famous um, hymn writers of all time. He wrote over 7,500 hymns. He wrote a hymn which I think was in part about John's experience on the seas. It's a hymn called Jesus Lover of My Soul. And some of you are familiar with it. I just want to share two verses of it, and then we're going to pray. He says, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O my Savior, hide. Till the storm of life is past, safe into the haven guide, O receive my soul at last. Other refuge I have none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, O leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. Would you pray with me? God, we're grateful for storms. It's a weird thing to pray, but God, we are so grateful for when we are pushed into situations that we can't comprehend. Situations that stress us and try us. Situations that show us what we're really made of and show us who we really trust. And so this morning, Lord, we're praying because we are weaker than we oftentimes want to admit. In fact, I'm always weaker than I would want to admit. And yet, Lord, we want to find you in the middle of every storm that we face. And so, God, our prayer this morning isn't that we would experience less storms. It's that we would learn what you look like right in the middle of each and every one of them. Help us to trust you more and love you more. Give us a sense of peace that can come only from you, God. And as the years go on, just show us. Show us the ways and remind us of how you've been leading us through these moments. We thank you for the ways in which you've revealed yourself through your Son. And God, help us to trust you more. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen.